I am a practitioner. So I teach, I also look after academics at VIT Bhopal. I have been in academics now for the last 10 years. I came from the industry. So I have a different flavor of how teaching should be done. So I am just going, what I am going to do is I am going to take you through some of the practices that I do in a classroom. Uh, and I leave some time open for questions. See, why is it that we need to, as higher education you know, institutions, why do we need to focus on technology? See, this is a problem that's, the previous speaker spoke about mobile phones, the engagement of the student, et cetera, with the class. Now, your, our students, the students who come to us are people who have access to technology. They are not going to be engaged in the class. So, for example, when I study, when I, I teach fluid mechanics, so for that I, I used to actually watch Shapiro's videos, which are classics, preserved in, the, uh, preserved in MIT. These are 40 minute lectures. So, and I, I asked my students to actually view that. Not one of them viewed it, okay? The reason is very simple. They are, they, their attention span is limited. There's no point in saying your attention span should increase. The fact is their attention spans, and we, we talked about LinkedIn feeds, Facebook feeds. So unless, because you're competing with all these to actually keep the students engaged. So we need to figure out new ways to do that. And the other problem is my colleagues, there's a lot of resistance in using new tools new techniques and new capabilities. And because of the very nature of our system, if, a, if something, uh, the culture is such that you want to, for three, four years, you want to at least use your same material. So that, that becomes an inhibit, it inhibits the use of technology. And in India specifically, there's a lack of trust on digital services and cloud technologies. Uh, so what are the major concerns that we have? Whether the learner outcomes, what will we do? Costs, we talked about fancy equipment. Is it applicable to the whole population? Because most of this is available at, in English. So will it communicate very well with other languages? Is it suitable for other skills? The cost of customization and difficulty because of poor connectivity. This is a big, is a trainer needed? now? The assumption is that if you move into digital education, you can replace the trainer. And is it the same skills that you have for lectures? Is it relevant for a digital classroom teaching? And how do we validate? Now, all these are questions that you can ask. But what does digital education help you in? It customi customization of learning. You can use assessment to give focused learning, adaptive methods. Okay, driven by AI can be used and provide the information in small amounts. Remember that that's actually the key because engagement with any methodology that you have is going to be very limited. So we can use, for example, what happens is the advantage now is that you can use recorded lectures, chat boxes so that you have peer-to-peer -peer increase uh, interactions. Submissions of assignments, this is a big chore. Okay. Now you can set timelines so everybody is aware of it. And what you can do is now increasingly, because in the, the workplace of the, of the 21st century, you have to have a lot of social skills. So peer-to-peer -peer collaboration you can encourage. So in some ways, the learning is much better when you go from, when the learning actually happens from peer to peer. So the class teacher, sorry, the faculty is just a facilitator. And the advantage is we can have monitored group activities. So you can assign responsibilities, you can find out who's contributed what, etc. 
Now, what I do is I teach new product development. I know this is slide is a bit unreadable, but basically here, what we have is this, I have, I use Moodle for most of my classes. So use, which is public domain. So, uh, so syllabus for the, is communicated up front. And the classification, the student lists, for example, how they are organized is told to them up front. Then new product development basically is the concentration is on generating new ideas. So here, what I've done is actually, I've looked at making vadas, right? There are different ways of making it. There are different machines that are available. So you can show different ways of how to make it automated, because the, I'm talking to engineers, how to make it uh, different solutions. So you give them links. And you can show that a different technology, for example, if you're making dosas, it's a different technology. You have different ways of making it. So the student is actually, and these are 30 second, 40 second videos, right? So the student comes, engages, and then I can ask them questions on what you learned, what's the, rather than saying, you know, this is the viscosity of something, and then spreading it, or how are you going to spread the batter, et cetera. You can actually show the experiment and then decide how the interaction is going to happen. Now, I give exercises, brainstorming, because when you have to develop new products, you need to do brainstorming. So explicit instructions are given on each of these, and these are given within the thing. They can access it wherever they want. Okay, so I take them through forward. And those of them, or those of the students who are interested, I can give them additional links on where they can pick up material. So you have the beginner, and then you slowly move on to the persons who want to actually get deep into the subject. And for example, assignments. Using the assignments, uh, sorry, using visit, uh, not assignments, using visits to the labor uh, practical area. I asked them to visit a retail store. Look at the list of commodities. Then there, are t there is an acronym that I, we use, which is called VRIN, okay? Valuable, rare, inimitable, in non-sustainable, et cetera. We use that to try and identify, and so that they then remember what these specific acronyms are rather than me giving a lecture of Bryn and then saying, running through a whole series of case studies, okay? So finally, for example, I have given an assignment on screwdriver. How do you develop a screwdriver? What are the best ways to develop a screw? See, I'm talking to a mechanic. So there is an instruction set that's given, which I haven't copied or showed that uh, because that is specific to the class, but it gives a tabular form which is similar to what is specifications that are used in the industry. So in a sense, the student gets to know what is expected when they actually move out into the real world. Okay. And within Moodle, for example, you have a huge number of activities which you can actually use. Assignment is what I use most, but I have also enabled chat, which means peer-to-peer -peer collaboration happens. I don't monitor that. But there are a whole series of games that you can use. You can use g g book with questions, crossword. So each of these methods, these are different hooks that you can actually use to connect to the students. So different students will work. Obviously, this is work, right? But then as an academician, when you start engaging in this way, you'll find that the retention is much higher, okay? So for example, crossword, cryptex, hangman, hidden pictures, etc. Kon Banega, Krorpati, you can set it up in this, okay? Snakes and ladders, Sudoku, which is used. And what you can also use is adaptive learning. This is basically where, based on the responses, you give them something to read. They read, they answer a set of questions. Based on the answers, you then move them on to some other topics. So you customize the learning for each individual student. So if somebody, for example, a math student doesn't understand what the limits of integration are, 
you make them understand, you know, what are limits, what are the, what's the upper limit, what's the lower limit. You give them exercises based on that and focus on that. Okay. So the lesson module is actually highly adaptive. Okay. So we tend to, I, I tend to use the lesson module a lot more for making the students in, absorb. You can actually use it, for example, you can make, it's completely self-directed. You can use the lesson to introduce a topic and as you progress, for example, you can start with India from, this is the, you can start with the geography, then move on to the history, you move on to the prehistory, Mughal period, etc., etc. You can go on, dive deeper into it. And you can allow for different learning styles. Do you prefer to read? And they answer yes direct them to a certain place, watch a video. So you don't have to, you know, one size fits all. You can tailor your course into different things. And for example, role play and simulation exercises, you can set up situations. Once you have thought through, it's fairly simple to say, do this. Now, this is something that's been circulating on WhatsApp in the last few days, right? Now. I just want to end with this because this, the reason why I, it came into my feed was that it was posted by one of my cl cl coll uh, colleagues, the director of IIT Delhi. And he was complaining that this is how it has evolved. Now, I look at it as an opportunity, okay? Let me look at it rather than, I know this is where I graduated from, right? So, in a sense, uh, my goal is actually to make sure my students are actually out here, right? So what can I do? I start from the reverse. You start by saying color the rectangle, so at least they know that it's a rectangle, if nothing else. Move on. What do they learn from this one? They learn it has to be a number, right? 2010, now you have to, you have got order of magnitudes into picture. Now you have moved on to a calculation. Right? And here you have not given the formula. See, here you actually told them how to do it. And here, now you have actually made them, they have to actually un understand, analyze the problem and pick up the right formula. And then finally, of course, this is a research problem, right? You figure out there are a lot of methods by which you can actually solve these problems, okay? So I look at, you know, this is the way I look at these problems. You sort of build it from the ground level up and take them through. And this is the big advantage of digital communication. You can actually set up these problems and make the students interact. You don't need fa very fancy equipment anymore. Now, connectivity, for example, was a big is a big issue. That was okay. I'll just wind down. Uh, connectivity is a big issue. What I did, what we did was we worked with vendors, and we made sure that, for example, adaptive learning, you need to always be connected to the real outside world, right? And one of the problems in India is that the internet doesn't function that well. So we actually made sure that the, and of course my students are always moving around so they don't want to be on a laptop. So they, they would like to have mobile access. They should, internet goes down once in a while because they are on the mobile, they're not connected to Wi-Fi. So we actually worked out solutions with the vendors which they were actually, the these things are locally stored and then it connects back to the network and they can submit their assignments. So there are ways you can actually work around all these problems. And I think this is probably AI driven, this is probably the way to go for education. Okay, thank you.